everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk today about collapsing the loop. And what that means is kind of collapsing the iteration loop, for the kind of whole development and, and getting the feedback and improving your solution by empowering uh, UXs with no code tools. So the, the project that I am talking about was funded by PEPFAR. It forms part of the technical assistance program uh, run by the CDC. And it represents the work of a consortium of partners, uh, Gemby, Path, and UCSF. Those are the primary partners. There's a lot of smaller partners as well. So it's a lot of people working together to produce a lot of global goods. And uh, my name is Zane Dickens. I am the design lead at Gemby. And what we do is we focus on strengthening public health through innovative technology. And this boils down to um, developing and implementing digital health information systems and data exchanges. So point of care, collecting the data and sharing that in order to produce uh, the necessary reports for both funders and for um, Ministry of Health decision makers in order to, to know where best to allocate their resources with the ultimate goal of improving um, patient care. And primarily, we focus on low resource settings. So uh, these settings face many challenges, not least of which is a lack of access to funding, uh, in unstable or inconsistent power, unstable internet connections, uh, lower technical capacity. And it's often a challenge to connect with users of our systems and validate our ideas. So I'm, I'm based right down here at the bottom tip of Africa in Cape Town, and we have projects in Cameroon, Kenya, Ethiopia. And so it, it's a real challenge to get on site, get a sense of, of the hospitals we're working in and the actual context of use, engage with our users. And so often we don't get as much of that as we like. Uh, now remote testing is a, poss is a possibility, but sometimes it's really difficult to validate your ideas using drawings or kind of even high fidelity prototypes. Mm -hmm. And so what you actually need is a coded MVP to get a sense of whether our users will accept that solution in the context of use. But the problem with a kind of coded MVP or full development iteration loop is they can take so long that the, the kind of looping doesn't often happen because of budgetary constraints. So you tend to focus on designing twice, building once, and then, then piloting the solution. And uh, just to clarify, um, although the graphic shows Africa, the projects we work on is global as well and targets countries as well like Vietnam and uh, Haiti. So as, as UX, is, uh, it can be quite frustrating because we're often constrained by dev time. We're reliant on developers to make our drawings real, to make our prototypes real. And it's kind of a universal problem that our designs uh, exist within the constraints of a budget. In my experience, there's usually more budget for development than for design. Um, that's fine. It tends to take more developers to screw in a light bulb, but that's OK. But over time, as a designer, you, you, get, you start to learn to scale your solutions to fit um, what is likely to be built. So it may not be the best solution. Uh, it may not be the most innovative or flashy or trendy kind of thing. Um, but you tend to learn that the best solution is the solution that gets built in the end. And uh, one example I have of this is a project we had in Zambia where we managed to get on site and we worked with these amazing bunch of maternity nurses to digitize a single piece of paper that they used during labor. And it was, it looked like an incredibly simple uh, piece of paper and they kind of jotted some key information and, and drew a graph and it kind of told them everything they needed to know about how this, this woman's labor was going. And we, we spent so much time with them building a solution that, that replicated that digitally, didn't just simply replicate the form, but built on top of it and gave them what they needed and what they thought would be amazing to use. And it was really quite innovative. And then once we got to the kind of development bottleneck, we had to strip out so many of these ideas, so many of these innovation features just to get version one built that in the end, they, they got something quite vanilla and that perhaps didn't solve their user problems in quite the same way. So that can be quite a, quite a frustrating thing, but you learn over time. And as, as I spent more time in this space, you, you kind of learn how to, to juggle things. So we're not paid peanuts, but if we were, there'd be kind of one peanut for design and four peanuts for dev, and then one peanut for a scrum person 
to make sure that the monkeys don't take over the circus. And what kind of happens is that anything that crosses that, I don't want to call it a divide, but the, the design dev divide gets really expensive really quickly. So you try to keep things on the design side and validate there, knowing that any kind of complex design you, you make tends to end up in complex development and times that by five peanuts. So you cut it down to the bare minimum viable product. You try to ensure that it's still a slice of the experience and not just the bottom of the pyramid catering to as many uh, basic features as possible. And you're, you're focusing, as, as we tend to do, on building the right thing. Um, you know, essentially measuring twice, cutting once, design twice, code once. But what if we could change the equation? What if the question is how can we shift more into the hands of UXs and free up to developers to do the really hard things? So instead of constantly building front ends or uh, reinventing the wheel, how can they do the harder, more, more fun for them integration uh, development? And that on a macro and micro level is where the Sandbox project came in. So the Sandbox is a one-stop digital health uh, platform. And what it aims to do is to be a single place for people to get digital health information, reference applications, software, and all the support materials that will help people use them. So it's a one, one place to test these reference solutions, learn how to implement these solutions, how to integrate them and how to support them, and a connection point for learning through courses, events, and communities. And on the front end, we have five main components. We have the solution catalog, knowledge base, learning academy, community forum, and events. And the solution catalog is what it sounds like. It's a catalog of reference solutions, reference applications with a product manifest. Now, the product manifest is essentially everything that a solution implementer could need to understand, learn, instantiate, and implement the solution in their own country. So it, it's everything. So instead of them having to chase around the internet to try and find all these bits of information, we consolidate it into one place. And so from that, that catalog page, they can get all this information. They can access a reference uh, instance, test it out as different users in different roles. Maybe they, they log in as admin or they log in as doctor, but they can, they can try it from multiple angles. And those get reset every 24 hours. And then within our knowledge base, we have products that are more focused towards things like policy or reference, um, sorry, requirements, templates, or things like a project management toolkit, uh, which helps support the actual implementation of one of these solutions from a project management level. So some countries would often have the technical skills or some of the technical skills, but the project management would be a weak point. And so that's why that's been developed to support that aspect of implementing and rolling out within a country. And then the Learning Academy has a selection of courses to help leaders learn more about informatics or in the instance of that, that project management toolkit, we have a course there on that as well. So people can upskill on how to use that course, how to project manage their implementation. And then uh, community forums, we have um, the Sandbox tries to follow a hub and spoke model. So instead of replicating everything outside and kind of copying everyone's information and then consolidating it, we link out to existing communities that have a lot of the experience, have the depth of knowledge to support people in, in implementing their software. So we link out to things like OpenHIE or OpenMRS uh, to, to give solution implementers access to people who know how to solve the, the difficult problems that they're likely to face. And then uh, with events, we try to connect uh, mentees and mentors or uh, experienced developers with inexperienced developers to help them with boot camps and hackathons and overall to increase uh, technical capacity within a country. It's one of the major aims of the project as well. So who is this for? Uh, who did we target this at? Uh, in the middle, there's decision makers. So they, they're the core user that'll come to the site to get a sense of what's available, um, what it entails, and how it solves the particular problems they may be facing, whether it's uh, patient identification and deduplication or uh, centralization of data. And so they, they'll be able to look at the available solutions, uh, get a sense of what's out there, create a shortlist. 
throw that over to their solution implementers who could go through it on a technical level and see what is the most feasible solution for them to take on. Um, and then all of this that they're using to make these decisions and to, to make a selection comes from our expert contributors. And these are people with decades worth of experience in public health and multiple implementations. And they're, what we have to do is kind of distill all that expertise and translate it into uh, kind of from expert to lay level so that these people can make the decisions and, and choose the solution that best fits their, their needs and their context. And essentially the overall point of the sandbox in this program is to facilitate the reuse of existing solutions to help countries stop reinventing the wheel, but rather focus on core solutions that meet the PEPFAR requirements. So what a typical scenario, what used to happen very often and has happened over the years is that all countries need to produce the same reports. Uh, there's a standard set of reports and, and standard indicators that allow uh, PEPFAR and the Ministry of Health officials to kind of get a sense of what's happening. And in order to produce these reports, a lot of countries reverse engineered the kind of technical solution that was required to make these reports and would um, spend a lot of time analysis time, sorry, a lot of time doing analysis, design, development, and implementation, either making a complete custom solution to produce the same reports or uh, building a customized version of, of a existing open source solution such as OpenMRS or Bumni. And what resulted was years and years of work to produce these required reports. And when you have years and years of work building something complex in uh, settings like this with low resources, it can often lead to problems and uh, failure in delivery or just an, uh, not producing those reports as easily as possible. And so the Sandbox support, supported route, uh, which supports decision-making implementation, aims to kind of reduce this to research and implementation, allowing people to, the decision-makers in ministry officials, to choose the right solution, have supported implementation, and get to these reports. Uh, so reducing years of work to months of work to produce the required reports, ideally. And so the, the idea here is to leverage a core system, use the same standards to integrate the system, uh, produce those required reports, and then just reduce all the effort, time, and cost to get there. So in, in order to do this, to help these, these three kinds of people uh, with expert contributors, we had to make collaboration and approval easier. So it, everything that they produce has to go through quite a stringent approval process to make sure that it's, it's up to the right standards, there's no mistakes, because all of this kind of feeds into healthcare, as you know, and uh, mistakes there have massive repercussions later on. So we have a very stringent approval process. And that expertise that needs to get translated uh, and simplified to allow decision makers to understand a complex landscape and to support their decisions. This is the kind of most difficult area that we're facing right now, and I'll, I'll get back to that a bit more later as well. And then with solution implementers, as I said, we have those manifest that we consolidate into step-by-step -step guides and implementation guides and installation scripts and everything they need to kind of get hit the ground running and go and then also what they need to support the solution once it's on the ground okay and this is a, a kind of simple high level view high level map of the sandbox so we have these shared work areas where everyone can collaborate we've got teams across the world uh, often used to joke that our and grumble that I had to join a meeting at five in the afternoon or six in the afternoon until I realized that our colleagues in Seattle were joining morning meetings at six or seven in the morning. So we, we have kind of very distributed teams. And so we need a, a shared space to collaborate and work asynchronously as well. And then all this work produces products that need to go through an approval process uh, where each kind of uh, partner, so Jemby, UCSF or PATH get alerted that something is now ready for partner review. The specific person gets alerted, gets an email, and they come in their review and it goes through this, this kind of tracking pipeline. Once it's ready, it goes into our content management space where it gets prepped for public release. And we have a very simplified 
kind of version of WordPress, essentially, that we've kind of put together. So it's like a content management system that has uh, training in place, as well as a little Kanban that allows people to create, use templates, and um, share for approval, review before publishing as well. And that, that allows us to structure the content in specific ways for each content type, uh, while keeping things very simple and reusing the same patterns over and over again. And then this filters into the website so that as soon as they're done, they publish, it goes to the website. The website has forms. And that those forms were gathering technical issues, which go straight into my development backlog. Uh, requested solutions. So sometimes a country will know of a solution that isn't listed and they'll request it, or a solution developer who want to share theirs. And so we have that product manifest form publicly available for people to fill in. And it's quite comprehensive. And they get a sense of just how much uh, is required for the solution and how much we need before we'll just put up a demo. And then as well, we have a routing help desk. So each product page has a link to this and it allows any products or any issues, um, sorry, any issues with the product or feedback to get routed to the specific person who's responsible for that product. Because we have a very, very, very small team, it's mainly just me and, and a few other people, we can't take on the supporting of each individual product or solution. So we have to route it to the right people. All of this, all of the stuff I showed you there was built with three no-code tools. Um, the main backbone uh, was Notion, which converts our content into, sorry, we use for the collaboration spaces, uh, the CMS, which then gets converted by Super in the middle here to a HTML uh, website, which is very fast and very performant. It allows us to add theming as well, as well as inject some JavaScript to do some enhanced things in the front end. And then all our forms and integration with Notion are handled by Tally, which is an amazing little startup. I think there's two people that do that, and they've got such an amazing tool that uses a lot of the same design language as Notion. So once you know Notion, Tally is really easy to use. And it's, it's those three things that we've used to build our entire solution. And we've done that uh, with one designer and a handful of non-technical users. We've built membership, collaboration, dissemination, and support. And we've done that by leveraging the development resources of, of other companies, namely these three tools. So they, they are the ones that update their products and release things that we can then use to enhance our own solution. And for instance, uh, we ran into a navigational issue. We got a bunch of feedback from our users that certain ways of navigating the internal spaces were difficult and it particularly had to do with the tree menu. And then very recently, Notion's released an update in their 2.18 release, which gave access to something called Team Spaces. And in a nutshell, that allows us to structure the navigation in a very simple way, uh, with permissions, in a much more granular way, and allow our users to find what they want in a much easier way. So uh, that was quite fortuitous, but what it means is that the tools we're using are improving their products because they need to. And on that basis, we're able to improve our solution based on their own releases. Another one that Tally did is Tally's recently released uh, customization, visual customization of their forms. And that allowed us to um, use the branding all the way throughout all these forms so that it feels more seamless with the rest of the site. So we use Notion um, to create these collaboration spaces and we leverage their authentication. Um, so you link from the, the website to an internal page. And if you're not authenticated, it kicks you out and asks you to log in. And if you log in and you've got a Notion account, but it, that account is not connected to um, the sandbox, um, then you can't access it. So it kind of creates a private space for us. And then within there, we use Notion's drag and drop block model to create content templates. So we arrange all the standard blocks in uh, templates that allow us to structure what we have, um, consolidate data into master databases, which we can show and filter in different spaces. And we, we use both of those to create our project workspaces. And these project workspaces allow the teams to work in a focused way on their own work and their own projects or countries specifically there's an in-country 
workspace over there, which focuses the views specifically for, say, Rwanda or Ethiopia or Vietnam, and they will see stuff relevant to their project only. But all of their meetings, all of their action items filter up into this page. And so the CDC and the funders have a high level view of what's happening very transparently and how things are moving forward. But also we have um, filters that allow an individual coming to the section to filter these meeting notes by uh, meetings that they're attending or action items that they have to do. So on the right there, you see it's, it's filtered for me to show my incomplete action items. So in this way, uh, we've increased a lot more transparency. We've facilitated a lot more collaboration. Uh, we've ensured that a lot of our task items that people come up with in meetings, because people often come up with lots of things that they want to do, but you kind of lose track of them. We've consolidated them and that allows people to uh, get a sense of what they're committed to, what they still have to do, uh, to keep things ticking along nicely. And then, so within each of those workspaces, they have the product, their own product trackers. Uh, I can't show too much of the internal workspaces because these are kind of private spaces and there's a lot of stuff that's still in progress. But once things get approved, they go into this, this publishing space. And this publishing space, you can see from the colors, um, maps to those sections that we had on the front end as well. So there's the knowledge base, community forums, learning academy, events, and solution catalog. And each one of those spaces has a, a flow like this, where we've got kind of the instructions on how to use it, which is collapsible, uh, and a little Kanban board where they can create new articles, for instance, and they, those will use uh, a default template, which will structure their content and give them kind of questions and, and things to fill in the blanks so that they they meet all the requirements we have there. And then, as I said, approval is really important for everything we do. Everything needs to get checked and approved. And so once they've built their page out, they've added all the content, they can move it into reviewing, uh, assign that to someone, that person will get a notification. Um, they'll come in, they'll do the review, they'll move it to approved. Once it's approved, the person can drag it into the, the published knowledge base section over there. And it's really simple. Uh, I've delivered a training in July to 40 people across, across the world. And the, the nice thing about Notion is you can also see people on the page in real time. So you're able to collaborate and get a sense of what people are working on and, and what they, they're using and how they're using it. So that, that was a great learning experience as well. And it's also, we've reached this point now where we've kind of got the base level uh, system in place. And so now, I'm reaching out to individual key users and finding out where they're struggling and what they have problems with. And I'm able to iterate much more quickly in a much more focused way. Um, as I mentioned with the team spaces, we've solved uh, certain navigational issues for a lot of users. And on this page, we've gonna make a couple changes to prevent people from accidentally nesting pages. And this is a view of the, the front page website. I showed you this is what it looks like inside Notion. In, on this page, you can do kind of line by line changes and it, it's a kind of a WYSIWYG. Uh, what, what you see is what you get and you can edit the pages like that as well. And so it's really, really kind of handy and it's a lot easier to use than um, WordPress and it's a lot more integrated into the flows that we have already. So once people learn how to do uh, workspaces, they, they're kind of a lot more familiar with the publishing space and, the, and how the way things work. All right. So we made a lot of mistakes and we learned a lot of things. And I also want to highlight that it's learned from, I want to say learned from our mistakes, but it's a lot of my mistakes. And this is one of the major things that uh, working on a very small team is, is that a lot can end up resting on one person's shoulders. And that can be... Uh, quite a problem uh, because no code empowers you to do a lot of things, but you end up with a lot of knowledge in one person's head or one person thinking about solving problems that themselves without being on a, on a bigger team. So usually when you have a, a developmental project or development project, you have a whole dev team and you all sit together and you work on the solutions together and there's cross-pollination, cross-functional ideas that happen there and idea gets tested from multiple angles. But if you've got a very small team, and one person who's empowered to do a whole bunch of things, you, you can run into problems there. Uh, another thing, you can't fully control the experience. 
So the, the one problem we have is um, the sign up or logging in. So it, it's a, a common issue we, we have is that we'll invite someone to the, the workspace. So we'll send them a, an email invite and that'll get handled perfectly and they'll get there and they'll get to the login page and they will do what they always do when they see continue with Google and they'll click continue with Google and they'll end up creating an account that wasn't invited. So we'll invite their work email address, which isn't the Google address or Gmail address, and they'll out of habit click the big red button and end up creating another account. So we that 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 kind of thing is probably the biggest uh, issue we have, but essentially you can't control the experience at a very fine tuned level. So that, that is a bit of a trade off. Another thing that happens, which I I realized uh, quite recently when I I was speaking with a colleague, because we want to build instead of those workspaces, we want to build hack spaces to support hackathons. Uh, and I was working towards a deadline and I was trying to get requirements from everyone so that I knew what I needed to build. And the colleague kind of stopped me and said, listen, we need to ask, are we asking the right questions? Do we know what we should be building? Um, do what do people actually need? Do they even need a hack space? Do they need help before this? Do they need a completely kind of concierge approach where they get helped from the beginning to plan and do all of that? And in the back of my head, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, that's really, really nice, but what do I need to build? And so I had quite a quite a startling moment of empathy for developers because in the past I've been the, the UX person that's kind of been uh, pushing back and saying, you know, we need to ask these questions, we need to find out if we're building the right thing. And here I was on the other side of the fence going, okay, I just need to know what I need to build and I want to get building now. Um, so that, that was quite, quite a funny experience for me. But essentially you can fall into the trap of wanting to build first and then ask questions later. And, and that's just something to, to remember that you can slide towards a more system-centric uh, mindset accidentally. The other side of things is um, documenting the sandbox way. So the way we did it, uh, like Notion has an amazing amount of help docs, but it's overwhelming. So what I've had to do is essentially cherry pick what, what is relevant to our users uh, recontextualize it for the sandbox, how we do things like the sandbox appropriate way. And that, that can be a lot of work. Um, but it, it kind of is what it is. And then what we found is that the tools are mostly easy because a lot of these tools um, are for profit. And so they, they're constantly optimizing, they're constantly approving for customers, which works to our benefit. So they're really easy to use. But what we found is content is hard. So tools are easy. We've managed to build the system, but the content is hard. Translating from our experts uh, for, at this level, where they really know what they're talking about, to people who are coming in who are really busy and re kind of really need to get a simplified version of what each of these systems is so they can make a decision, getting from there to there is, is really, really difficult. Uh, I know our previous talker spoke about AI, uh, so I'm actually going to look at a AI kind of simplification tool to see if that, that might help there. Um, again, looking for tools that, that empower very small teams to do a lot more work. I think that tool is called Quillbot. I still need to experiment there, but I, I think that might be a way for us to do that in a, a smaller segment. And then uh, something, if you're, if you're fastidious and you, and you like constantly improving things and fixing things as you see problems, um, you can become, like I did, prone to endless optimization. And this is particularly problematic if there's no delay in what you change to what is live. So often if you'd optimize something, it would have to go in dev and go through a whole thing and then it would go live and there'd be like a release schedule. So people would, would have a few weeks, like say for instance, Chrome, it gets updated every six weeks or something like that. So th there's kind of a, a progress to that. But if, if you're seeing things that could be better and you're just changing it all the time, what happens is your users can, as they log in infrequently, kind of get a bit surprised because things aren't the way they expect them to be. You keep making it better, um, but you have to kind of communicate these changes. And so what we're looking to do is have a, a kind of monthly newsletter where we release uh, updates and changes so that we can keep our user base up to date with what we're doing. And then uh, there's quite a big learning curve. And that, that learning curve is not so much in the tools, but the most appropriate way to use those tools for your organization and your own specific workflows. So with Notion, you have Kanban boards and you have uh, 
image embeds and video embeds and call outs and like there's a whole bunch of little Legos that you can use. But there are fewer specific ways that make sense for your use case. And sometimes it takes a while to figure out and that needs to be done before sharing and, and before training. So that, that can be a bit of a chicken egg situation where you haven't had enough time to find your best pattern uh, to reuse before you have to train people and before they start using it. So we, we got caught out with a proof of concept idea for a work plan that I shared too early, which ended up getting used very quickly and causing a lot of frustration. So that, that that's just something to make sure is that anything you build, you test, you refine, you use it as much as possible, the, the same principles. So um, essentially a lot of this boils down to no codes and powers kind of rapid uh, development or rapid changing. Um, and sometimes that can lead to bad habits, not testing enough, not refining enough before sharing. And you end up confusing people who are very busy. Um, they're very smart, they're educated people, but they're very busy. So they don't really have time to fall in love with your system and work out all the quirks and stuff. They just kind of need to jump in, do things and move on. And this leads to my the kind of last point is that even though it's no code, it should still follow normal dev processes. So what I, after a year, realized I needed to do was ensure that I was scoping everything appropriately for the amount of time I had. And I've created uh, essentially a mini Jira within uh, my sandbox workspace. And what that does is it, it chunks out my work according to releases. I add points on there. Uh, so I can estimate effort, and I use that to communicate with the client as to how much I'm taking on, um, which of this is related to our work plan, which is urgent, what should happen, what's nice to have, and that kind of thing. And in that way, we have kind of a, a regular kind of release flow. Even though it's no code, it still follows a kind of um, agile process, which I think um, is, is made things a lot simpler and also a lot more structured and a lot more um, stress-free. And, and transparent. All right. Uh, yeah, we, we learned a lot of things and we, we, we're still learning many more. Um, that was a very high level view of the project. It's, it's really quite complex. But if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. I'm happy to give a bit more detail in, in any area you guys are interested in. Oh, thank you so much for that, Zane. Appreciate it, man. It's quite insightful. Um, we have a comment from one of our speakers, uh, Ilario mentioned, love your list of key learning spots. I think they make sense in many design projects. So I really like that. Um, just one question for me is like, you guys have no developers. Uh, we do have developers. So we had them a lot more in the beginning of the project. And then some of them left, some of them rolled off into other things. And uh, I kind of stepped in and said, listen, we can we can solve the wiki problem. So we just started out with just a wiki, uh, swapping out this with Notion. And then as I learned the capabilities, I was going, okay, fine, we can we can do collaboration, we can do this, we can do all these other requirements that we we have in mind with this one tool. And so it's in, in a way I shot myself in the foot. <laughs> and I, I put my hand up and and a uh, bit too much, but we we managed to build up a lot of it. Um, and then as we've been going, I trained up non-technical users to to help with making these templates and building things out and supporting it with their specific teams. Um, that, that's a key thing that we do. And in terms of, do we have any developers? So we have developers for the Sandbox Cloud. So that um, as soon as anything goes into the server, it's kind of, it's a black box for me. It's like, I don't understand servers. I can do front-end code, but once it goes back and it's, it's kind of uh, beyond me. So we have developers there who help with the harder stuff. How do you run cloud infrastructure for this? How do you provision it automatically? How do you uh, load balance? How do you make sure that it all um, works everywhere and people can access it? And if there's problems, we know about it a, on a timely basis. So that kind of harder stuff. They're not really involved in the, how do we make a collaboration space? And, and how do we make a, a pretty website? You know, that kind of thing. So we've, we've taken that off their plates, which isn't really their, their speciality anyway. Totally agree. Okay. Thank you so much. Will you be able to make your slides available to us? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Okay. Thank you very much, Zane. 
um, especially on such short notice. So great stuff, man. Cheers. Cheers, cheers.